Hi, I'm Victor with Echoes of Insight, and I'm here with John E.K., president of the Soundview Community Media. Thank you for coming here today, John. Thank you for having me. So how long have you been here with Soundview? Soundview actually started in uh, 1998 mm -hmm. as an offshoot of the Discovery Museum in Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Tom Castellot was actually the founder of Soundview Community Media. I came in in 99 mm -hmm. um, when they were building the first studio in Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've been here ever since 1999. That's 25 years. Wow. Yeah. So uh, what did you go to college for to be able to work in this field? I went to school for communications. Mm -hmm. I went to Southern Connecticut. And I've been working in the field ever since in some capacity, corporate, medical, broadcast, sports, mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff. And uh, is there any particular reason why you chose that course or just you got experience with it and that led you into it? Yeah, well, what I started out uh, when I got out of high school, uh, the only thing I was really good at was English. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went, became an English major and then I got into journalism and then I got into radio and it was just a natural thing to go into broadcast. Uh, I, w I was, you know, I had intended on being a writer, but I fell in love with the actual technical parts mm -hmm. of TV and became a broadcast uh, engineer, so. Mm -hmm. So uh, you learned how to work everything that there is to do with broadcasting? Uh, not everything, and actually, you know, it's funny because when I started years ago, it was, everything was analog. It was old tube kind of cameras and videotape and uh, it was standard definition TV. We have HD now, which is, uh, you know, most people your age probably never saw the old tube type TVs. But um, so, you know, I learned everything back then, but as, you, as technology got ahead, mm -hmm. now, I mean, everything with you know, the computers and virtual reality and all that stuff, there's so many, so many elements to broadcasting now and just mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the media itself, the technology, it's overwhelming. So. Do you like the direction technology is going in uh, broadcasting? Oh, uh, sure. You know, I mean, the virtual reality stuff is kind of neat, you know. Uh, the video games that, you know, I understand you guys are going to be doing a little gaming competition on the podcast mm -hmm. uh, studio. Uh, you know, they left me in the dust a long time ago. You know, when it went from Super Nintendo to N64, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but what I see technology wise and what people are doing with the technology and not just gaming, but the applications go to medicine too because they're mm -hmm. visualizing you know, the human body in 3D where they can go in and actually do scans on people and go in and diagnose diseases mm -hmm. using the similar type of technology. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's only getting better. Mm -hmm. So, it's cool. It's a good time to be alive right now. I agree. I think right now it, where everything is advancing so fast is just crazy, especially in medicine where 20, 30 years ago, there weren't as many treatments for certain things that people nowadays don't have to worry about anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I used to work, I used to do medical videography. Mm -hmm. And I remember back in the 80s, they were talking about recombinant DNA as being a huge technology that would advance medicine. And if you just look at DNA technology when it comes to like a forensic um, police work, you know, they're solving crimes from 20, 30 years ago because they have the DNA, somebody's blood samples from back then, they're matching up the DNA now. Mm -hmm. It's it's just uh, incredible technology and it's moving faster and faster. Mm. And how do you feel about AI 
mixing it into everything. Um, AI is, again, you know, when you talk about the speed of technology, what's going to happen with artificial intelligence is you can't even imagine at this point. It's just moving so quickly so that uh, it will be a tool for, for people to use for good, but it can be a tool for, for bad, too, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really think that, like, in certain fields, um, you know, it's going to make our lives easier mm -hmm. and it's going to bring, like, a lot of, um, you know, areas that have needs, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to bring or solve a lot of problems in those areas, you know. Mm -hmm. For certain countries that are lack resources, you know, the, the, you know, the computers can solve a lot of the problems, the, the logistics and, and the uh, <clears throat> just being able to, um, to move resources from one area to another is, you know, is, uh, it's a tremendous help in that area. And uh, do you like how AI is being integrated into everyday items such as just our phones and being able to ask it to find something? that is you know, on your phone? For somebody your age, mm -hmm. it's kind of a, you know, you're at the beginning of, of this revolution. Mm -hmm. So say you needed to write a term paper for school, mm -hmm. you know, how, you, you can use AI to do that. Yeah. So now the education system has to figure out how we can develop a curriculum which takes advantage of AI but doesn't allow the student to just, you know, use it to, to skip through everything, skip through everything. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting when you think about it. I don't know about you, how you've used AI uh, much, but, but you guys are probably using a lot more than, you know, the older generation of people because they still can't quite conceive of how it can be used mm -hmm. because they didn't grow up with computers. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, people in their teens and early 20s don't know life without a phone, mm -hmm. you know, or without a computer, without that personal assistant. So the, that tool is going to be natural for, pe for younger people to move into that area quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, at least, I, I mainly use AI for research since it pulls data that it's learned from the internet. Right. And that makes it very useful for finding information that you know is most likely correct and also a usually legitimate source. Uh -huh. But I think uh, the accessibility of it makes it uh, too good for cheating. So like mm -hmm. you could use it to write an essay and then right. you're not really gaining anything from cheating off of it. Have you heard recently they found that some AI, um, I don't know if you'll call it a query or AI exercises or, or projects that they launched, found that the artificial intelligence uh, machine was returning faulty mm -hmm. uh, data back. Have you heard about that? Um, I saw that Google's AI was being, since it was being trained on various websites that not all of them had legitimate sources would come back with bad results because someone made a um, satire. Right, right. Kind it's of interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, because who knows, you know, like I said before, they could use it for bad, you know, yeah. as well as good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so AIs are built on language models. Mm -hmm. So you can actually program a language to be sarcasm or whatever, you know, faulty. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of neat. Um, in broadcasting, what kind of challenges have you faced with your career? Um, well, right now we're, we're facing a funding challenge, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, this industry is like, is really, uh, it's been here since the late 70s. Uh, in Connecticut when they first laid cable mm -hmm. through the state to allow people to watch TV uh, over cable instead of over the airwaves. Mm. And um, 
you know, what, what has happened to that. So a lot of people consider public access TV to be legacy TV. It's old, you know, it's the, the old technology. And now everybody's streaming on the internet and things like that. So the funding for, for our types of TV is fading away, mm -hmm. even though if you go to our website, soundviewtv.org, you can watch any of our three channels right then and there live. So we're using the same technology that, mm -hmm. that um, streamers are using, but we're still stuck in the old world because we're considered to be a TV station that only runs over cable. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate, it's a challenge though. You know, uh, you know I, one of the other challenges I had was I worked on a development team for uh, um, virtual advertising. Mm -hmm. Um, when uh, they used to put advertising on, well, right now you see it in baseball. A lot of times if you look behind the batter, sometimes you see an ad and sometimes it's just a green mm -hmm. um, banner, like the green wall that we're sitting against. Mm -hmm. And um, the challenges of that was, well, how do you put that banner on, uh, or that ad on the banner and then you zoom the, t the camera out, how do you make that stay in, in perspective so the viewers don't notice it's actually an advertisement? Mm -hmm. So I worked on that early on in, in virtual advertising and that was a real challenge for a lot of the engineers that I worked with. So it was really fun though, mm -hmm. because we got to solve a lot of problems and, and develop the technology to where it is nowadays that where a lot of people don't even notice it. Mm -hmm. It's in basketball, it's in hockey, it's in, all of the major sports, soccer was one of the first sports mm -hmm. to develop virtual advertising. And uh, so that was, that was kind of a neat area to work in. Mm -hmm. um, does that help you in your everyday life today, working here? Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Everything I've ever learned, even going back to the first analog stuff, I mean, <clears throat> you know, that's the foundation for where we are today. Mm -hmm. So uh, we used to work with two inch videotape, you know, big reels that you would have to put on these like about the size of a Volkswagen. <laughs> the, the videotape machines were huge. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that technology always stays with you. You know, the, the, um, the concepts, you know, so with uh, the older analog stuff, how would you do um, transitions and cuts with in video? Because you would have to physically cut the film, right? Well, uh, I can't, when I started, it was the early electronic editing, mm -hmm. you know, so you, we, had, we had switchers and special effects generators and things like that. We didn't act to actually physically cut the tape to do an edit. That, mm -hmm. that, so that was just about out. But um, you know, the early days of electronic editing, you would have to move the videotape forward and backwards and try to figure out where you wanted to do your edit. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, with nonlinear editing that we have here, you, you have a clip, you just drop it into your timeline Mm -hmm. and you look for the end point, you could speed through it really fast. You could drag things around, drag and drop. It's almost like you're editing a Word document, mm -hmm. but it's a video uh, yeah. document. Uh, it's, it's completely different than it used to be, so. And was it difficult to learn how things worked as they were advancing over time? You, you have to stay up with the technology, you know, that you have to, you have to always train on new systems, mm -hmm. you know, that's why, you know, nowadays, I mean, we're, because of our funding, we're limited, we can't invest in new technology, mm -hmm. but you really have to stay up on the newer technologies because uh, they're getting cheaper every day, but also mm -hmm. they're, they're doing a lot more. So where do you want to go is what, when somebody comes in to do a project, you have to ask, you know, what do you want to achieve with mm -hmm. this? You know, do you want, a lot of people want to do talk shows. It's very easy to do a talk show. Um, I was talking to somebody this morning, he wants to do 
a music video. Mm -hmm. So he wants to use the background, but he wants to ch have the video, you know how music videos are structured nowadays, like mm -hmm. they're changing scenes all the time, like rapidly, you, you know, they're in broad daylight, all of a sudden they're in, at nighttime, you know. Mm -hmm. You can do that in a studio with, um, you know, the, the green screen and stuff like that. So his concepts, that's his idea. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we help him develop his idea? So he's gonna come in and, and shoot in different angles, you know, mm. but a music video is one song. So you're, you're using that one song, but you're cutting all the visuals. That's where the creative, creative part comes in. Because the song's already been written. Mm -hmm. The song's been recorded and, and you know, and so now we focus on the visual. And that's, uh, that's interesting, it's an art, mm -hmm. you know? So you have a technical thing, you have to know how to make the lighting right and make the angles right and things like that. But it's also a creative thing, you know? Mm -hmm. How do you tell the story with your video? So we go from a very simple concept of a talk show up to m more complicated concepts of, of music videos or art types mm -hmm. of videos and things like that. So, um, how do you plan for the future of Soundview with um, the struggles you're facing? What do you plan on doing? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. That's a really good question because a lot of it at this point is unknown. Uh, because of the difficulties, now we're part of um, there's a lot of public access centers in the state. Mm -hmm. Some of them are independent, and so they are, like us, we're a third party. So we're independent from the cable companies, mm -hmm. um, and we're independent from the towns or the government. Um, but, um, so funding is a real challenge for us. Whereas the cable companies, they, they have public access facilities as well because they're required to by the law. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they're not invested in, in like growing mm -hmm. their public access facility to serve the community. They're more or less, you know, and this is the way it was originally. It was meant to be, we give you the facilities, mm -hmm. you produce the show, you know. Mm -hmm. What we're finding is public access now has to go out. We have to go out and say to the community, we have the the, the technology and the facility mm -hmm. to help you, you know, cover an event like a, a parade. We did the uh, veterans parade last year. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have the ability to do work with the schools to cover, you know, like football games and live events and things like that. That, you know, that's that's how we're relevant in the community. Mm -hmm. We're not just a facility where we we're here. Come in and do your show. You know, we still are that. You know, so people that are interested in the First Amendment, right of free speech, can come in here and tell their story and give their opinions. And that's a, that's a big thing because, you know, you can't do that on YouTube. Mm -hmm. You can't do that on Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, because what happens is the, the freedom of speech only goes so far on those venues. If you say yeah. something that people don't agree with, you can get kicked off. Mm. And it doesn't have to be like, uh, an authority doesn't agree with it. Just mm -hmm. somebody's of the opinion that you're being, you know, mm -hmm. overboard. You yeah. know, well, who makes the rules on that? You know, they're private companies. Mm -hmm. YouTube, YouTube isn't governed like we are. You know, we have to apply to the or abide by the First Amendment right for, to free speech. You know, the downside of that is if somebody wants to come in and say something that's controversial. Mm -hmm. You know, like we had COVID, you know, Co a lot of people were like, I don't, I don't believe in vaccines, mm -hmm. you know, we couldn't really stop somebody that wanted to come in and say that, mm -hmm. you know, um, because it's their right to, you know, and, um, but, uh, uh, you know, private companies, they don't, they don't, they can just kick you off, mm -hmm. you know, if they don't like what you say. So, I mean... Unfortunately, you know, if public access TV goes away, if the funding dries up and it just goes away, 
you know, where are you going to exercise your free speech? Mm -hmm. It's going to probably be in the streets, you know, which yeah. is not is not good, you know. But um, I don't know. It's it. Stay tuned. You know, we'll see what the future has for for you know Soundview and public access in general, and uh, you know television in general. And uh, since you mentioned COVID, was Soundview strongly affected by COVID? Uh, well, what we did was we, uh, you know, just abided by all of the the, the rules. You know, we shut down for, I think we were closed for about three months. Mm -hmm. And then we opened with very strict, uh, you know, safety guidelines, like uh, sanitized, everything was sanitized. Mm -hmm. Everybody was wearing masks. Um, you know, we could only allow like one person in at a time, you know, mm -hmm. we, so it took us a while to get back up to full speed, but we, uh, we didn't stop cable casting. We allowed our producers to continue to, to send their videos in. Mm -hmm. What we had to do is we were all like DVD at that point. So they producers wanted to come and drop their discs off. So we had a box where they could drop it off. Then we had to sanitize everything to make sure. Mm -hmm. Then we had to get it into the system and we kept cable casting. Mm -hmm. And they could also submit online. So we've been doing that for a long time too where they can actually, uh, it's called um, Connect. And so they log into Connect and they upload their show to Connect. We would download it and then we would cable cast it from there. And um, what kind of process does someone have to do before getting their show or video to you? Is there any process they need to go through? Well, there's two ways to get a show on public access. One is if you have something, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a, a, you know, on your computer and you want it on TV, you contact us and you, you, the requirements are you have to live, work, or go to school in one of our towns mm -hmm. in our area, uh, which is essentially all of Connecticut now. You know, anybody in Connecticut can get a show on Soundview if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, after that, uh, if you want to use our facility, you have to be certified. And mm -hmm. that's where the training comes in, like what you guys are doing with this. Uh, you guys will be certified after this mm -hmm. and our rules are like you have to be 18 or over to get certified but with this program through the workplace mm -hmm. we're allowing even people under the age of 18 to be certified because this is a very thorough course you guys are going through it's not our basic mm -hmm. course that we teach so so you should all be producing shows after you uh, graduate from this course um, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's how much effort you want to put into it and how, um, you know, how available it is, mm -hmm. you know, and also the people that you meet, you know, a lot of times it's hard to put on a show by yourself. So, I mean, there are people that can go out with a camcorder, or even a phone and, and make, you know, a TikTok video that's a minute, but to mm -hmm. make a 29 minute show that's gonna keep people engaged, it usually takes more than one person, mm -hmm. you know? So, but that's why we, we try to build the teams, you know, with the classes so that you guys stay connected to each other and help each other out if you have an idea for a show, mm -hmm. you know? I think this uh, program that you guys run is very beneficial and it is, very useful and applicable the things that are taught and also Good. with how everything is going in social media i think uh just learning how video shots and uh mic work editing all that is just an extra thing to know right and have now uh, let me ask you is that been a of an interest before you joined this course? Is it something you've been interested in and doing, maybe doing in school? Do you have a media program at school that? Um, 
not at my school, but there is, I know some schools in Bridgeport do have, uh, I think they do like morning news for the campus. Cool. Yeah. And just for me, before this program, I wanted to know how to edit videos. And I also like taking pictures. So whenever I saw something cool or interesting, I would take a picture and try to get it framed in a good way mm -hmm. so that it looks presentable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the framing's really important. Have you had a chance to work on the editing system here? Yeah. Good. I think it's really interesting to see how you can just drag and drop pieces of your video and film and just make it work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we so we uh, after after the show, I can show you a, little, a couple things that you know you might be interested in because uh, you know video equipment is not cheap, you know, mm -hmm. and some schools have the resources, others don't to to have a bunch of systems. But the editing is uh, is really a, a good tool. It's a good thing to to have mm -hmm. in your arsenal of <laughs> tools mm -hmm. of skills because yeah. if you look at like websites and stuff like that websites are all incorporating video mm -hmm. and so you know um, video people are needed nowadays to help with corporate corporate uh, types of productions and website development you know you can if you're a web developer and you have no video background you need a video person mm -hmm. but it so it's good if you want to go into web developing to still have a a, a video, mm -hmm. you know, education, a basic education at least. So, I agree. I think this program is very, very helpful. Cool. Um, I think we're out of time for today. Thank you for coming here, John. Well, thanks for it's having me. It's been a pleasure to have an interview with you. I enjoyed it. Me too. This has been Echoes of Insight. Thank you and have a good night.